first of all, I, I, this, is, this class is the, it's called The Industrialist Dilemma. It's all about disruption of legacy industries, legacy business models because of digital technology. And I appreciate um, you really taking this seriously because you're, you're using a BlackBerry right now. So I, 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 thank, you for, thank you for really underscoring. Everything the, else is just a toy. Yep. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I have do, another one. Do you want to explain the BlackBerry situation that you have going on? In, in all seriousness, it's, we just completed a fairly sizable deal. And in the middle of it, I didn't want to switch. You don't want your, like, your email model to change. Well, okay. it's, you, you go to China a lot. There's totally hear you. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so that's what happens you know, when you're doing $3.5 billion acquisitions, I guess, right? And, and I've got an endorsement deal with Black. Okay, that's good. It's, it's, All the other ones are paid. It's on brand. Paid. It's yes. good. Yeah. yeah there you go. um, what uh, do you want to sort of set things up around? What's the state of legendary today, given that deal that you just did? I mean, that's pretty breaking news here. Uh, yeah. So we, we did a deal uh, with Wanda uh, from from China, and uh, I've been very friendly with the, the chairman of Wanda for the last two and a half three years, and uh, he approached me last spring, and we just closed the deal recently. Um, I still run the company and still have a uh, rooting interest in the company and all those, all those things. Uh, but for my chair, it was a great outcome for shareholders, which is you know, part of my job, if not all of my job. And when you look at the future of where things are headed in terms of growth, um, I think China is probably the biggest market in the world by 17 or 18 at the latest. Mm. Uh, our films had already done very well in China. Uh, our analytics group has been uh, in China for the last 18 months, you know, in a, in a pretty meaningful way. And so for us, it, it made sense. There was yeah. a lot of different sort of roads and choices, but this made sense for us. We actually had uh, Tony Fidel in as the second class, I believe, and uh, or third class. And um, the way you were describing offline around the kind of control that you have of, of running the business, all the creative control, you are sort of the nest of, of Wanda, I guess. Yeah, I mean it's early days, but it's, that was it's an attempt at analogy. Sure. Why not? Okay. <laughs> what? Um, so why don't we why don't we step back and, and um, could you describe the state of it, yeah, the media industry is obviously too broad of a concept. There's there's too many different things going on. But if we just zoomed into film and uh, and theatrical uh, kind of entertainment and uh, television media. Do you have it? Maybe you could kind of give us a little bit of a backdrop of like you're in the center of Hollywood. What is the state of the world today uh, in the media industry? Well, I, I, I think um, the clap, not you're at Stanford, so I'm not surprised by this, but some really smart and important points were made around the room. Number one, this is on the theatrical side, is becoming a winner takes all business. So the, the, the films that are breaking out uh, are doing better than ever. And films that come out, even if they have a star, even if they have a lot of money behind them, that's not a shield against going to almost zero. And that, that is a very, very different experience than when I first started in this business in 2004. Uh, the second thing, my, my own personal opinion, because people will talk about the fact that the films aren't quite as good and so forth. I, you know, I grew up, I graduated from high school in 1988. There were some pretty bad movies in the 80s. I don't think they have a, we have a patent today or yesterday on, on that. But it is the choices. Um, one of the things I had our analytics group do was that, you know, there's, there's tracking, there's Nielsen ratings. What I wanted to know is, in your waking, addressable, in your, in your time awake that is addressable for consuming media, how are you spending that time? Where are those points that are eroding for us that didn't exist before. Whether it is Snapchat, whether it is YouTube, somebody sends you a link to an article and it links to three other things. All those little things add up to less time. And there are high class choices when you talk about television. I think we're in a golden age of, of television. We, we have a, 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 you know, a nice and robust television business. And it used to be that television was sort of like movie jail. If you're a writer, <laughs> actor, or director, and things weren't going so well or you'd be, that's all gone now. You have the most creative people in the world crossing over back and forth. You have incredibly compelling uh, television. You certainly have new models with people binging on it and so forth. So on a Friday night, I don't think it's just what movies are going head to head. Right. What's in your Netflix queue? You know, what, what are the other quality forms of entertainment? 
that perhaps have a lower barrier to entry, meaning I got to get in a car and drive somewhere at an appointed time, um, you know, th those are all pretty big barriers. So um, that, that's a little bit of a, how we think about, uh, you know, what, what's going through consumers' minds, and, and good enough is certainly not good enough anymore. It kind of has to be great. And somebody had mentioned about uh, franchises, which I think is Hollywood's second favorite F word. Um, <laughs> and it, it's an interesting thing because while we're flooded with that, we certainly do that at Legendary, some of the things that you see break out, whether it's Deadpool, which is the biggest surprise of my career, you know, mm. being, being around this, an R, hard R-rated film like Deadpool, and I, I think it's awesome and, and really rooted for it, or Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, they, they did a great job with that. But things that are completely different, you know, um, are, are doing well, and at the same time, people want to see the franchises that they know and love. So, and we're going to talk a lot about sort of Legendary's business model and and kind of evolution going into the future. Um, obviously, because of the blockbuster successes you guys have had with Dark Knight and Jurassic World and and, and those kinds of movies, um, I want to make, be clear about one thing. You said um, the movie uh, business is becoming more and more winner takes all. Is that because of the amount of choices people have? And, and so the quality has to increase, and so the movies get better, and that then creates a winner-take-all uh, uh, environment? Or like, what, what about the past five or 10 years has created winner-take-all scenarios for the movie business, just so we're super clear on the landscape? Yeah, I, for, you know, my own personal opinion, it, it's a couple of things. It is the quality of choice. I also think we're becoming a swipe left, swipe right society in which we decide in mass, something is worth my time and I should go see it and want to be a part of it, or it's not. Um, we were fortunate enough to have Straight Outta Compton uh, this mm -hmm. summer become a big hit for us, even in places that maybe, uh, and in demographics that you wouldn't have thought would be excited about the movie. Um, and, and people just decided through social media and other things that it was, it was worth seeing. Um, I, I also think that the winner take all mentality is just that there's no slow build anymore. Mm -hmm. If you go back, just for fun, uh, and look at how Titanic performed, I mean, it came out to a modest, I think it was like a $14 million opening, and played for months. That, and my, that'll never happen again, ever, for, for a number of different reasons. But there's, there's not a lot of big multiples against opening weekends. We've seen that squeezed down because there are so many other choices you're now also seeing movies open in February and March that are $150 million movies, which never happened before. Mm. One of the things Legendary is known for is your data analytics and how you look at markets and trying to attract mm -hmm. audiences to the content. One of the comments that got raised during the class was the role of kind of art versus business. And how is that changing Hollywood? And specifically, how is data and information changing how Hollywood does business? Um, well, well, a couple things. First of all, our analytics group and team, they're mostly, they're from Harvard and MIT and they sit in Boston and I told them the first time that I ever see you sitting in Hollywood, wearing a beret, sipping a latte and reading a script, you're all fired and, and I'm in trouble. We wanted it to be complete separation of church and state. Um, in terms of the creative side, they have absolutely nothing to do with it. Zero. Um, we're not going to tell Chris Nolan what to do in the third act. If it, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, so the reason that we originally went into this is I felt the advertising spend, which I didn't hear anybody talk about, but that's the part to me that is not sustainable. I, I don't know if you know how much money we spend on advertising, but it's not a great model at all. What's the scale we're talking about? 120 to 140 million dollars worldwide, you know, on advertising for a film, for a film, for a big film. So that's that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. what, what's not sustainable about that is spraying it all over the place and spending as much money on people who you know aren't going to come, or folks that, you know, if you're advertising Dark Knight and you're telling a 15-year-old <laughs> who's wearing a Dark Knight T-shirt, please come see my movie over and over. That's not very efficient either. Hmm. So um, put the analytics group together to talk about people that were persuadable. And the first directive was very simple. I want to cut our ad spend by 15% and I want to be no less effective. 
Uh, we went live on Godzilla. That was the first time we ever actually swallowed hard and did it. We cut our ad spend, and tracking had us opening at $60 million, and we opened at 94. So that, that was a good start. Um, and it, it has had a material impact for us. Were, were, you ever, were you able to actually track the people that you advertised and did they buy tickets? Yes. Okay. We, we, we were very calculated about it and almost like a business case study because if you don't test city to city and it's just, well, you has had a great trailer. So, right. Uh, and, and Warner Brothers did an amazing job, certainly on the ad campaign. Um, What's happened since then is it helps us to find audiences on television and launch shows. We've been successful with that. And um, over the last year or so, we were approached by some very large companies and asked if they could license wow. our platform. So it's turned into a very robust business for us. Do you see a, a future where that in itself becomes its own business model out of Legendary, or are you kind of doing that as a hobby right now? Uh, well, it's inside, you know, of, of what Wanda bought. Right. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been going, the, the two areas we wanted to expand into was China, which, which we've done pretty successfully, not only with Wanda, but some other big partners, uh, trying to be early on consumer behavior patterns and analytics there. And the second thing is, is making sure that we had great core expertise around mobile mm -hmm. and, and what that interaction looks like. From an, from an analytics standpoint. There's, um, uh, uh, on the data theme, there's uh, uh, clearly a trend, or at least uh, there's a lot of noise about Netflix and how they use data mm -hmm. to target what kinds of shows they should be uh, green lighting and, and buying. Uh, a, do you, how real do you think that is of a trend? Do you think that, that sort of is instructive to the future of, of, of what kind of media gets created? Not necessarily what shows up in the third act of the film, right. but do you green light <coughs> certain kinds of tele TV shows or certain kinds of movies? Yeah, look, Netflix is extraordinarily successful, and Ted Sarandos, who's down running content in LA for Netflix, does an incredible job. I think what it can potentially be are guideposts you know, to concept test, and whether it's stars or questions that you want to ask, uh, I certainly think that can be interesting. Um, we, we tested Godzilla versus King Kong because I was excited about it, and it turned out people overwhelmingly thought that that was a cool thing. So we concept test okay. it, we just don't. Before you spend the 100 million, 200 million on making the film. Yeah, yeah, so Netflix, you know, they have a formula and, and it seems to work for them. How do you spend your time and how do you manage now a, a different type of organizations as you've added new types of businesses, new people you support, et cetera? You know, this has become pretty complex. What does that impact to you as the CEO? Well, it's uh, the, the mandate that I put forth four or five years ago was we have to diversify because simply being in the hit business and we make five six movies a year not 20 or 25 like a like a movie studio so you got to have a great batting average um, so we went into television we went into analytics both to take care of our margins on the spend side uh, on, on our advertising which again has had a, a, a big difference for us uh, we have a pretty big digital presence. We own uh, Nerdist. Mm -hmm. We bought Smart Girls, Amy Poehler's company, uh, Geek, <laughs> Geek and Sundry. So we've got a fairly uh, decent-sized digital footprint um, and are launching an SVOD model that, that we're pretty interested in. So it was about diversification and certainly making sure um, a number of years ago before it was fashionable to have a real uh, hold in China and to you know, learn and make mistakes and try to, uh, try to be good partners in, in that corner of the world. And in terms of my own time, it's, uh, it's split between the creative process and being very involved uh, in, our, in our movies, trying to look around corners and see what is the next version of, of analytics. Um, and, you know, you talk a lot about disruption, and the only thing that I know is if you if you stand on the railroad tracks hoping the train's not going to hit you, it's going to hit you. So we're constantly asking ourselves, what does it look like when day and date happens? Right? That, that's going to be a, a pretty big shift uh, when consumers are offered, offered that package. I, I would also say that um, for all the choices, you mentioned cat videos and so forth, <laughs> I, I still believe in high quality, long-term ownership of content. I believe forever that's going to be an extraordinarily important thing. Um, 
I believe it in sports, and I certainly believe it across movies, television, and digital. There is a scarcity that I would not underestimate. Talent is scarce. Whether you're you know, a great filmmaker, an actor, an artist, and we all see it, we all recognize it, and I, I don't think that that is going to get wider. And so that's something that I think, you know, studios will have to organize themselves around that principle because it's a pretty closed ecosystem. Um, but you're also not going to be able to sustain the massive overhead and, and spending patterns that are there today. So um, <clears throat> before, before you came on, we were talking about how distribution has increased. And I, I, I would say just to characterize that, we've moved from a model where you, your distribution was um, you know, VHS or DVD in, in physical stores, you had movie theaters, and you had a few you know, cable networks and, um, and broadcasting channels. Mm -hmm. To now you have Netflix and Facebook and, and YouTube uh, and Snapchat and Instagram, and there's you know, maybe an mm -hmm. you know, order of magnitude increase in actual endpoints. And there's probably an order of magnitude increase in people that are at the end of those delivery channels, i.e. the internet. So for you and Legendary, and then I'd like to kind of maybe broaden up to, you know, let's say your Warner Brothers or your, your Sony, how does that impact the, the sort of overall strategy? Does that, does that mean you move even more into the blockbuster approach? Because again, that choice means mm -hmm. that highest quality content <coughs> wins. Or do you move more toward, I need now 50 products to reach all the different sort of variants of how people are going to want to consume media. And then if it's the latter, how do you actually monetize that? Well, the, the way that we look at it is there's sort of two categories of films that we'll be making in, in the future. Uh, branded blockbusters, or we hope they're blockbusters, but branded large tentpole films, or smaller, containable, targeted films. Uh, you know, 42 is an example of that, straight out of Compton, mm -hmm. uh, Hangover. We, we made a movie called Krampus this Christmas. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was, uh, I mean, we made it for $9 million, and we spent a third of what you would normally spend on advertising uh, to put it out on 3,000 screens. And it turned out to be a very nice hit for us. Uh, we did just under $70 million. Mm. And from a, a, stand, a, a, you know, a, a business case standpoint of allocating the right capital, being very targeted, and using... But you still made... Uh, how much of that money was made theatrically in, in theaters? What I just named was only the, the theatrical portion. Right. So it'll be out... Uh, would that work the same way in, in a day-and-date model where you don't have all of the, the sort of guaranteed access at the theaters? <clears throat> I, I believe, first of all, it's inevitable. And second of all, I think it'll broaden audiences. The price points have to be right. And the offerings have to be right. It's obviously going to have a huge impact on the revenue streams of the movie business. But I also think the amount of money that we spend, what used to be prints and physical distribution and physical DVDs, there's a lot of friction points there that day and date and digital will also help. Right. Now you just have to be very responsible about the way you're, you're spending money. So if you're a, a bigger studio with a bigger cost structure and you're entering this new world, do you have to lower your cost structure, including individual films and marketing, or do you need more products across all the digital channels? Is this a <laughs> revenue growth mode or a, a sort of lowering you know, the, the cost to make media? I, I think it's, to, to me, it's a couple things. It's to ask yourself, what kind of organization are you going to be, right? If you've got thousands of employees, massive physical space, the, the one place we don't really shoot is in Los Angeles. It's just cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So these massive lots and, and so forth that are very expensive. And so I, I think what you have to ask yourself is, what is your core competency? What is it going to be going forward? What can and can't you defend? And I think from a cost structure standpoint, I would stand back and say, we're going to have to make some very tough choices. Once you've gotten that under control, then I would look at what your advantages are to making content and filling those different pipelines. I, I'm, I'm a big personal investor behind uh, uh, both virtual and augmented reality in, um, uh, with Magic Leap down in Florida and the Oculus guys who did a great job and are now part of Facebook. Congrats. Uh, I personally don't think the tip of the spear there is watching our movies in VR. I, I don't think that's that compelling, both in terms of the time spent, 
And artists will come up with a way to give you, you know, a different experience and a different journey. And that'll, that'll shake out and have a revenue model. But I think there's a lot of people in Hollywood that are looking at that as, oh, that's another stream. And I, I just, I think it's going to shake out a little differently. If you look at how the younger generation consumes media, so we've got a room full of people in their 20s and 30s, you know, do you see them going to fewer movies in the future? Do you see them, you know, not spending as much time as previous generations have, and how does that impact the type of content that you create? Well, I would say I'm still a big believer in going to the movies. Uh, somebody mentioned IMAX. It's a great experience. Watching a comedy with a crowd is different than watching it at home, even with a few people. Watching a massive blockbuster, you know, seeing Avatar, which Jim did a mm -hmm. great job on that film of giving you a reason to go. So I, I still think that that's part of our cultural fabric, and I don't think they're closing up anytime soon. I do think people are going to be more and more discerning, and I, and I think we're seeing that certainly in North America. Um, the patterns we're seeing in China are different. There you're seeing an expansion of middle class. You're seeing people uh, enjoying going to state-of-the-art movie theaters, which they've built all brand new stuff. Uh, so, so that's been interesting to watch. But, um, you know, and how it impacts us in the future is really what I just talked about, that it either be, it needs to be so compelling and great that you have to go see it in that format, or you should, or contained enough that however you choose to do it, you know, that it's, it's fiscally responsible. Um, Steve Jobs uh, had this classic line, which was sort of, Hollywood doesn't understand Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley doesn't understand Hollywood. Um, I'm sure it was more eloquent <coughs> than what I just said, but the, um, the, the idea was, you know, these are, these are two worlds that have never really been able to partner very effectively. Um, but certainly with iTunes and with Netflix and with Facebook, that has begun to change. What is the current sort of state of thinking from, from Hollywood's perspective of Silicon Valley? I mean, you bridge both worlds. But let's say you weren't as sort of, um, uh, sort of in between both worlds as much. What is the sort of state of thinking? Is it that, that Netflix and Facebook begins to take all of the leftover margin at, at, at the platform level? Is it that they come in and, and create all the content and, and leave very little money for anybody else? Is it that they end up moving eyeballs into completely different um, you know, behaviors? What, what, what is the viewpoint right now? I think it's a mixture of fear and opportunity. Right? The fear from both directions is I, I think those that own the platform realize that professionally made content at the highest levels is important and not fungible. Uh, and you're seeing that with the decision points, whether it's Netflix or, or, or Apple, are, are making by saying we've got to be in the original content business. You know, HBO made that decision smartly 15 years ago. And I think the fear side of it on both ends is you know, the tech companies, they have bigger market caps, right? You're not, you're not going to push anybody around. Um, and, I, and I think that traditionally in, in maybe Hollywood had been maybe the attitude. We're, we're going to wag a finger and, you know, bully people, and that, that's not happening up here. <laughs> uh, so I, I really hope things get bridged because it's counterproductive and, and calories wasted not to. And I, I really think there are ways to work... Uh, you know, smarter. If you look at what happened in the music business 14, 15 years ago, where, you know, the music companies decided the, the way to respond to Napster was to, quote, sue it back to the Stone Age, or whatever they used to say, I, you know, and then they allow Apple to come in and build I, the iTunes platform, that, that's probably not highest and best outcome if you're the one sitting on the content. Do you, do you perceive there to be any risk that, that these technology platforms, though, can, uh, can move the eyeballs and attention completely away from traditional content? I mean, you're, um, as an investor in Magic Leap or Oculus, those platforms uh, might not make as much sense for linear entertainment, and we might get the same sort of entertainment value out of, out of new forms of content, i.e., um, or, or thus being a risk to traditional, sort of the traditional DNA of Hollywood. Is that, is that a material risk? Is that something that you think about? I, I think that VR and AR are the first completely new experiences that I'm aware of. Because er everything else, whether it was VHS to DVD or high definition, it's all, I mean, better mm -hmm. pictures, right? Sharper pictures, better sound. 
Uh, but VRAR is a completely different experience. So as we talked about a little earlier, anything that's going to erode from your time and attention is a threat. So you know, that's why we hedge and try to be in that business. I don't think anybody's figured out exactly what the model is going to be yet. Uh, we have a lab on the 12th floor of our, of our building where we have very smart, creative, amazing people coming in every day, and we wanted to have a place where they could experiment and say, I don't know, play around with it. I'm sure you'll come up with something. Um, but there's no question it's a threat. What, what's your, I guess, best hunch of what that content type looks like in the future? Is it more just akin to video games or what? Best I can tell, and I, I certainly, you know, it's interesting, when YouTube, you know when people first started passing around videos and saying, you got to see this, right? I think on VR, the first couple of viral things that are three, four, five minutes long and make you feel, make you feel something, right? And also I think the social component is huge because anything that we consume in discrete packets is never as exciting as some communal experience the experience you're having now, notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that the first time that something like that breaks through and is passed around and people then see what the possibilities are, all those little movements that need to happen, then all the creative people that say, yeah, yeah I should spend cycles in this. I should spend money on this. Consumers saying I should pay it. And, and all those little movements that all of a sudden add up to it's now a thing. Again, I think that's inevitable, but that's what I think the first couple of movements look like. And, and then I think it's um, certainly there'll be video games on it, uh, but I, I think the quantum leap happens when we can go in the matrix, whatever, together and kind of look around and, and have a shared experience. Cool. All right, Thomas Stoll, thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.